The Power of Persistence Anything worth doing is worth doing badly, a quote from G.K. Chesterton. In the worst case scenario, a lot of patience and perseverance are required before seeing any results start to manifest. I was a worst case scenario. In my first year of accelerated self-healing, I didn't feel fundamentally any different. It took me a couple of months to get started on my 14 dental restorations to remove the huge reservoirs of mercury that were leaching out of my teeth at a relatively rapid rate. Each time I replace two amalgams with white composite materials, I was being exposed to, to an increased level of mercury from drilling out the old fillings in order to reduce my future exposure. My body also, was also unable to eliminate mercury so we were working against its tendency to build up even higher levels stored in my vital organs. I was taking remedies identified by my mentor in Canada to balance my biofield as analyzed by electrophysiological measurements from German diagnostic electroacupuncture. I was also learning the methods myself and practicing on myself and any family members who would sit for it. Discovering the existence of this kind of energetic testing called med testing or medication testing in Europe was a real revelation for me. It was even being used in some hospitals in Germany and Israel to select medications that would produce fewer side effects for the individual being tested based on the coherence in the body's electrical response. The members of the British royal family are known to rely on it. In fact, I worked with a Hawaiian prince who grew up in Buckingham Palace. When clinically indicated medications and remedies are tested with this approach, most of them do not produce a beneficial response of increased coherence in the body field. Thus, nine out of 10 clinical hypotheses are rejected without having to undergo a month of clinical trial. Because the process of finding well-suited remedies is so much faster, it is said that the clinician practicing this method gains the equivalent of 10 years experience in their first year of practice. Considering that ratio, I must now have accumulated the equivalent of over 350 years of practical experience, though I like to think I don't look a day over 300. For myself personally, I was able to go from taking over 40 remedies based on laboratory testing analyzed by an advanced computer algorithm to needing only about 10 remedies to balance my biofield. And that computer algorithm was quite powerful. One of only three complaints about my New York practice came from it. I'll tell you the other two in a bit, but just like the other two, this one was a complaint by another doctor. Here's what happened. A concerned mom had brought her teenage girl in to see me for her vision problems. She had very poor visual focusing ability, which we call accommodative infacility or insufficiency. At that time, I was still doing all my nutritional work through laboratory testing. So we had ordered a couple dozen routine blood tests, plus we did a trace mineral analysis of recently grown hair to screen for heavy metals and mineral imbalances. We sent all of the data off to a computer facility. Remember, this was in the 1980s, so there was no internet yet. They analyzed test results in ways far beyond the standard lab report. You see, when you get a lab test, they report a statistically normal range of values based on all the people they test. So first of all, that is a population of people that includes a lot of sick people. It's a clinical population. So your numbers have to be pretty bad to be out of range, usually worse than 95% of people trying to figure out what's wrong with them. But that's not even the main point here. If we look a little deeper, we see that most test results follow something like a bell curve distribution. That means there is a central tendency that the body is trying to maintain, but it also means that most people are either struggling to increase their level of that measurement to get it up to the norm, or they're struggling to decrease that value. In terms of physiology, which just means function, by the way, those are two distinctly different functional states, eureka. So if you take a few dozen separate chemical or material measurements of the body, typically almost all, if not all of them, will be in the laboratory's clinical normal range. But most of them will be either higher or lower than the norm or average. 
The specific patterns of elevated and depressed findings then present a very diagnostic fingerprint of the body's physiological state. In other words, you go to the doctor because you can feel that something is not right. They order a blood test and it comes back normal. So they tell you to come back if it gets worse and they will test again to see if it's gotten bad enough to show up on the separate tests of material levels that the body is desperately trying to keep balanced. Sound familiar? Well, after a few weeks, between getting the results from the lab, sending them off in the mail, and then getting the analysis back, we learned that this girl's particular pattern correlated with a high risk for acute pancreatitis. She never had pancreatitis, thank goodness. So her mom purchased the nutritional supplements that the report found indicated, and off they went. Well, it turned out that the girl was not cooperative at taking the recommended supplements, so they mostly sat in their bottles on the kitchen counter. They might well have done more good had she been willing to take them. We do find that. A few months later, the girl indeed wound up very sick and in the hospital. The diagnosis? You probably guessed it already. Acute pancreatitis. So a few months later, after she had recovered, the mom was meeting with one of the girl's physicians. The mom was really questioning why none of the other doctors she had taken her daughter to saw the problem coming, especially since Dr. Swartout did. Who is Dr. Swartout? They wanted to know since they weren't familiar with the name. She explained that he's the girl's doctor of optometry. Well, you'll have to imagine for yourself the response that got. All I know is that the doctor filed a complaint about me. Yeah, my bad. I made the whole medical profession look bad. In a more perfect world, I would imagine receiving an inquiry about my methods that allowed an accurate prediction of a serious acute illness. But no, New York State was not that perfect world. Instead, the medical board decided that doctors of optometry should definitely not order lab tests anymore. It was an unspecified gray area in the law at the time. I was a licensed doctor, so labs were happy to provide their services to me. There was nothing in the regulations that said they shouldn't. But the letter of the law did not say whether I could or could not order those tests. One of the other two complaints I received while practicing with my father in New York for about four years was also about testing. In this case, it was specifically about non-invasive trace mineral analysis of the hair. Again, in their wisdom, the New York medical monopoly decided that life for them would be simpler and better if they would just outlaw a non-invasive test that they didn't use and couldn't otherwise control. So to this day, our remote clients who live in New York State have to go to a neighboring state if they want to have a hair trace mineral assessment done. My apologies to the people of New York for being such a troublemaker. I certainly never intended to do harm to any of those poor physicians who found my practices to be disconcerting. As one lawyer I know who is also a saint said, I mean none harm, I think none harm. That lawyer is St. Thomas More. The third complaint was considerably more innocuous in its outcome, but I had better share it now or you'll likely conjure something worse. I was learning and implementing methods of what we now call photobiomodulation. For example, I put full spectrum lighting in the clinic. And when half of the front office was changed over, I happened to be pacing back and forth, concentrating on reading a technical article. But all of a sudden, as I was passing from one light spectrum, regular fluorescent, to another, full spectrum, my attention was drawn to a very noticeable shift from eye strain to eye comfort and ease. I was also exploring the use of selected bands of light in the visible spectrum for healing through the eyes. Yes, that means color therapy, the technical form of it, syntonic optometry. Syntonics had been a very popular form of therapy early in the 20th century, before the advent of the present pharmaceutical era. Here's what happened in a nutshell. The Rockefellers had perfected the art of monopoly, first in the oil industry and then in transportation. Since the state of greed is fundamentally insatiable, they looked to medicine to further expand their market. Besides, it was actually a return to the original market. Did you know that rock oil was the original competitor of snake oil? And rock oil, petroleum, won the marketing battle for use as medicine, even though we now know that real snake oil 
is actually the highest known source of essential fatty acids. Today, probably about two-thirds of all medicines are derived from petroleum. The other one-third still come from plants, like metformin from French lilac. So how did the Rockefellers take over medicine, resulting in petrochemical pharma now being the most lucrative business on our once green and botanical medicine-covered earth? They started along with the Carnegies by funding the Flexner Report. It was a study of the various fields of medicine, all of which were unlicensed and largely unregulated at that time. They were looking for the one approach to medicine that would give them the one thing they most desired from medicine. No, not healing, profit. The winner, of course, was then known as patent medicine. With a patent, you could set your price and eliminate all competition for many years. And as you may know, the Rockefellers considered competition a sin. The competing forms of medicine at that time were many. Patent medicine, also known as allopathic medicine. Allopathic means different disease because treatment with a toxic drug introduces a different disease into the body, which typically suppresses some function that is causing a symptom in the body's attempt to heal itself. Homeopathic medicine was the leading form of medicine at the time and still is on a global scale today. Homeopathy is stimulatory, non-toxic, and has no side effects. Botanical medicine uses the medicinal qualities of plants that we have shared this earth with throughout our genetic history. Naturopathic medicine, which relies on nature for healing. Osteopathic medicine chose to join allopathic medicine to avoid being wiped out when state licensing laws were being promoted by the Rockefeller Combine. Today, they are rediscovering their roots. Eclectic medicine is my favorite. Their philosophy was to consider all of the other methods and select the one most suited for a particular patient or condition. The strategy of the monopolist was to build on the foundation of patent law, adding state licensing of physicians to drive out other competing methods of healing and establishing the FDA to suppress competition and even communication about the healing properties of anything but their approved patent medicines. The most extreme example was when someone suggested that water could be used to treat dehydration. And the FDA actually ruled that to be a drug claim. I'm not kidding. I've seen, for example, a copy of a letter from the FDA telling a company that, quote, there is no mechanism for evaluation of non-toxic cancer therapies. You see, the drug in this case was a derivative of the herb Chelidonium magus, or celandine, and it had already been approved to treat cancer in other countries. The problem was that it's non-toxic. That's why you'll never see a non-toxic chemotherapy approved to treat cancer in the States. Even though there are over 100 cancer cures documented in the medical and scientific literature, it's a sick system. Don't get me wrong, there are times that our medical system is the best place in the world to have access to, like major trauma. And many of the diagnostic capabilities are wonderful. Just watch out for the invasive diagnostic procedures. Ask yourself, how will I treat myself differently based on the information from this procedure? Now, back to color and light therapy. So way back when, the FDA made it illegal to ship color therapy books and instruments across state lines. Yep, you're, you're safe. <laughs> that regulation is officially still on the books, last I heard. Your tax dollars hard at work keeping color out of the gray-suited world of pharmaceuticals. So from the time that thousands of eye doctors used color to heal the eyes and vision, to the time that hardly anyone even remembered that there was once a college of syntonic optometry based in Ohio, only took a generation. When Doctor of Optometry Raymond Gottlieb, OD, FCOVD, PhD, FCSO, was researching for his PhD, he came across some references to syntonics and began a process of intellectual archaeology. What he discovered was a couple practitioners in small Midwestern towns who never got the message that light officially doesn't work anymore. In fact, the people in their towns didn't realize it either. Even the light itself seemed to be ignoring the new edict from on high. 
when someone new moved to the town and complained of a sinus headache, instead of pointing out the location of the town's pharmacy, the neighbors would simply let them know that they should go to the local eye doctor and look at the blue-green light. Problem solved. So when I was researching how this rediscovered modality of photobiomodulation could help heal vision and eye health issues, I was also fascinated with the new research coming out on seasonal affective disorder, SAD. Not to be confused with the other SAD, the standard American diet. I had reprinted an article about full spectrum light therapy for seasonal depression and had a few copies in my exam room to share with patients. A patient came to me who recounted her medical history of depression and the medication she was prescribed on and off as needed. I inquired if the depression tended to be worse in the winter. She seemed impressed with the question and said, as a matter of fact, it was. I told her of the research that was being done in psychiatry and gave her the article reprint so she could be informed about the latest advances in science and medicine that were quite relevant to her personal health. I proceeded to treat her for her visual situation without suggesting that she should even consider changing anything about her medication or how she was handling her pattern of depression. But when she shared the article with her psychiatrist, he apparently felt that I had stepped on his toes. He actually filed a claim that I was practicing medicine. The claim was rejected. I wasn't practicing medicine, I still don't. I do teach people about healing though, especially about how you can heal yourself and do it faster than the damage is occurring in most cases. In my case, once I had removed all of the amalgam from my teeth, I found that my body was ready to receive indigo light. When I did that, I experienced a tremendous wave of emotional release, tears of relief and comfort. With that release, my eye pressures finally normalized to 15 in both eyes from the high 20s. So that's how in 38 years as a doctor, I have had three complaints, all by other doctors, not one by a patient or client. For many years, I practiced optometry as a licensed eye doctor in New York, Oregon, and Hawaii. Now I am providing wellness care and practice pastoral medicine. Instead of treating diseases, I treat health and wellness. Instead of treating material body parts, I treat the whole energetic person, body, mind, and soul. I'm still a doctor, but no longer a doctor of the state. Now I consider myself a doctor of the church because spirit matters. You can treat and manage the dysfunctions of the body and easily forget that the quality of life is what is most important to the sufferer. A study in England looked at hypertension, high blood pressure. The treating physicians all agreed that the patients improved with drug treatment because their blood pressure numbers looked more like those of healthy people. But were the patients actually healthier? In this rare study, they also checked with the patients, their family members, and their pastors. They found that they were all in agreement too, but not with the conclusion of the medics. They all noted that the patients were less healthy, less energetic, and less actively engaged in the community. The thing to realize is that the body is intelligent, more intelligent even than doctors, despite all the years of diligent study, the degrees and the licenses. You have to ask, why does the body increase blood pressure? The heart has to work harder to increase that pressure, and the reason is the resistance to the flow of blood through the kidneys, which are the high-pressure filter to clean the blood. So the answer is that when the blood is not clean, it gets thicker, and a higher pressure is needed to clean it. So what if instead of adding toxins that suppress heart function, we worked on cleansing the blood? We could still monitor blood pressure, not thinking of it as a disease, but as a biofeedback on the effectiveness of our cleansing process. You see, I have come to believe that when we diagnose disease and treat it with a toxin, as we do routinely in allopathic medicine, we're actually introducing two new diseases. One is the toxin, the other is a demon. That sounds extreme, I know, but hear me out. A demon is simply an angel that has no life of its own. All of its life energy and power comes from our faith belief in it. That's why exorcists will tell you that the first rule is to pay no attention at all to them. Think of the curé of ours, one of the holiest men of all time, who paid no attention to all the physical phenomena others reported happening all around him when they visited his home. 
evil consists of vortices of darkness. And like shadows, all the actual energy and power of those forms comes from the light. That's why we focus on treating function, not dysfunction. When you try to kill or even manage a shadow, you just create more darkness. So I encourage you to strive to think of your diagnoses, not as things or entities, but merely as observable, identifiable patterns in the flow form that is this temporal body that is gifted and loaned to us in this life. Practice the art of Aikido with your medical status labels. Receive your symptoms as honored messengers, rich with meaning and guidance for your path to spiritual growth and development. Our spiritual gifts emerge from the alchemy of healing as we face the challenges life brings our way. As my fellow Dartmouth student and poet, Robert Frost once wrote, I took the road less traveled by, and that has made all the difference.